Hey everyone, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Gigabyte X299X Water Force Extreme. And the motherboard itself comes with its own, from Gigabyte, full cover water block. Now the water block calls the VRMs, it calls the CPU, it calls the PCH or the chipset, whatever you'd like to call it, and your PCI Express as well. Comes in the box, it's all part of your warranty, so you're not going to have to worry about pulling heat sinks off and losing warranty and all of that sort of stuff. And because it's water cooled only, there are no air heat sinks in the box or available at all. It did give me an excuse to put a rather nice system together. It's still got our normal test equipment in there, 2080 Ti and the new 10980 XE to really give those VRMs some punishment. But it gave us an excuse to have something quite pretty to work with for this one as well. So you're going to get your normal review stuff, you're going to get a breakdown of the board, the performance, what's in the box, but then also some eye candy at the end as well. So I'm going to give you a decent look inside the box because it is not your average motherboard box. There is an awful lot of stuff in there. So there's a completely separate box for the heatsink. There's a PCI Express 4 add-in card. There's a lot going on in there. And to be fair, for the price where we know this is going to be north of a thousand pounds, kind of needs it as well. But stick with us and then we will be back to have a look at the sexiness in a moment. So it's such a behemoth, I thought I'd better show you what's actually in the box as well, because it's not normal. But I do like playing with the, <laughs> the lights, because it shows up the uh, cool colours on the box. Anyway, it is an absolute monster of a motherboard box, to the point when you pick it up, then, oh, it's properly, properly heavy. Anyway, what I will do is I will walk you through it all. But you pull the first one out, and this is the uh, add-in card. And then there's two other boxes in there, which we will work our way through. But it's the, the size and the weight of the box kind of makes you feel a little bit better about how much you've paid for it. Anyway, the add-in card, basically, this is uh, a PCI Express NVMe add-in card. You can put four of them in there. It does a uh, 16 times slot as well. But what you can do with this is you can actually use it to put PCI Express 4 drives in. Then it goes through the PCI Express here and you should get enough bandwidth even on X299, which isn't technically PCI Express 4. But you can put PCI Express 3 drives in there as well and it means you can raid them up. It means you can get a lot more uh, NVMe drives in your system. If I slide this one out. Oh, crikey. And oh, I'm not even joking. The weight of this box here is as Raj on Big Bang Theory would say redonkulous it's just insane so beating my way through all of the packaging to stand it up for you here here you can see so you've got the big chipset block down here this will be for your M.2 and then you've got the main heatsink up here which does one of the chipsets here just below the CPU but then you do the main CPU one and then it also does at the top here the VRMs and if I pull this out just a flipping heck I cannot stress to you enough about how much weight there is in this block it is yeah it's insane now obviously what this does mean is when you do build your rig and you put it on it's going to be quite difficult for you to be able to get then at your cpu and everything as well now this itself here just to kind of put it into context is the size of a normal aurus motherboard box so in this box alone there is the motherboard and all your accessories and everything else so you can kind of get why I wanted to do this and show you all the extra uh, info. So in here, as I've said, is your motherboard box. Now, there you can see a very, very bare motherboard, but very, very bare for a reason. Um, you see all your um, power phases up here. It's got dedicated 16 times as we've kind of already 
spoken about. You can see your M.2s over here, which are going to be water cooled as well. Your X299 chipset. I will show you a proper look around the board. But it was, like I said, really, it was to show you just how insane everything was. You do get a normal sticker pack. It's very standard Aorus. And then inside the box, there are a couple of temperature sensors, which you can obviously affix anywhere that you wanted, but then access those temperatures through the uh, software. Oh my, there, there is an awful lot of stuff. So this is actually a speaker, believe it or not. Sorry, no, it's not. It's a microphone. And this is so you can actually tune your fans to how noisy they are. So you can get them to base the RPMs based on uh, user set noise limits. That's actually pretty cool. Then we've got a couple of uh, SATA cable packs. There are three in total, giving us six, but they are all soft braided hose. Uh, Aura seems to be one of the only companies at the moment that only give you the braided SATA cables now. Now I know a lot of us are, you know, SATA cables are slowly being kind of, I don't want to say phased out, but we obviously use NVMEs a lot now. Um, but it's nice to have some decent quality connectors. You do get an Aorus badge. And then in here, these are just your um, RGB extenders. You get two normal four pin ones and you get two three pin ones, which are for the addressable RGB. Then you get your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antennas. There's a pair of them there. Some Velcro cable ties. They can be very handy. Driver CD is now finally, thankfully, coming on a USB stick, which is epic. Why it is also even better is it means you can keep going in and updating the drivers as well. Because obviously the ones on the CD are always going to be out of date after, even sometimes when you first get them. So uh, do remember when you do do an install, maybe the second time, update the drivers from the website rather than using the normal ones. And it will save you some time in the long run, just like you would with a USB Windows 10 install, for example, if you're a Windows user. Okay, RGB, oh, come on. This is another box in a box in a box. Now this I haven't seen, but it says it's an RGB fan controller, Commander. Okay, SATA power there, motherboard sync. So there's a lot of cables to go with it, but you can see that you've got all of the extra gubbins. We'll see what this is like when we actually get a chance to get it installed and using it. Underneath, there are just an awful lot of cables for it. But like I said, I've not used this or tried it, but we will try and get that in and used when we do the build, because we are doing a build, because we have to, where it's water cooled. Um, Anyway, that's enough of the, I mean, look at this carnage here. If I move the, that's an awful lot of stuff. And that's just your motherboard box. And I've not even started anything yet. Anyway, he's moving on. So you've seen what's inside the box. Now that's all well and good. And then we went through a uh, fairly lengthy procedure of building it as well. Now I was going to drop this into the, uh, pretty much the same water cooled system that I built in the uh, Corsair 500 earlier on with, and it had a, uh, another motherboard in there and I was hoping to be able to switch out. The board is actually a little bit deeper and it does need an extra slot. So go careful with your cases. You are gonna need that eighth PCIe slot at the back of your case to be able to get it in. Because of that, we then ended up with this in the behemoth that is the, what I will call the Cosmos, uh, but it's the C700M. And because I had the M, it meant I had more room so that I could get another radiator in the roof. So we've got two Corsair 360 millimeter radiators. Um, it's, there's push-pull LL fans on the front, but we only went with this single set of LLs in the roof just to be able to get clearance. And it also meant that we didn't have to mess around with putting a second set of fans outside the case on the top. Uh, and probably for easier cabling around the back, if I'm perfectly honest. Then we've got the, um, it's all Hydro X cooling in there other than the Gigabyte water box. So we've got the Hydro X pump that's attached to the radiator, the Hydro X um, water cooling block that is added onto the 2080 Ti. Uh, and I use this because if I'm perfectly honest, it was already here. I'd been sent this stuff before and it just made my life really easy to just be able to grab stuff that I'd already got. So it's pretty much uh, the same sort of idea that I did with the other build in that I, I have used flexible hosing 
But it, it, with the way that I've rounded it is to try and hide it so that it, there isn't a lot of, you know, of it visible. But there is one bit visible down the front and I've done some sexy B-roll just to be able to show you. But when you are sat beside it, the, really your eyes just get drawn to the CPU block or the actual reservoir itself. You don't tend to notice it too much and it's quite a nice way to hide it. If I'd had more time, I could have done like pass-throughs and stuff to have completely eradicated where the hose was visible anyway and got rid of those loops um, but it, it, you know in reality by the time that I had the processor and all of that sort of stuff we just ran out of time to be able to do it but I think for something that took us basically a day to put together I think it does look quite nice and I do like the monochrome kind of uh, differences between it now Talking about performance, obviously big water cooled block, couple of 360 millimeter radiators with very capable fans. I was expecting great things. But sadly with the water block itself, the VRM temperatures just didn't kind of seem to sync up. Now at stock, it was absolutely fine, but, and it was kind of like, about where you'd expect it but is when you when you put the overclock into place they they didn't get warm to a fact that they were unsafe definitely not i mean when you think about that this thing could be pulling north of 600 watts with that 4.7 gigahertz overclock and you can go and see the cpu review on the channel and on the website as well because with the 10980xe at 1.175 volts what that then meant is uh, I was running at 4.7 gigahertz fixed. Now that's a very, very healthy overclock for an 18 core processor. And if you think about the 9980XE that we were really struggling with before, it's one of those things where um, I, we're not talking about like comparing it to uh, the other brands and stuff, but they do create quite a bit of heat and it does uh, um, pull quite a bit of power as well. And when we were testing that, we were not using AVX either. If you use AVX, it can use even more power and create even more heat. But the VRMs for me, I'd say they were probably about, if I'm honest, about 15 degrees warmer than I was expecting. Definitely warmer than I was expecting for a water block. Now, with the air-cooled blocks, what you do end up getting is they are like really nice, very fine fins on them now. So there's lots of surface area and it's obviously not attached to the CPU either. And with this, it is kind of attached. So there is the possibility of talking about heat sink or heat um, uh, soak rather coming from the CPU and kind of going up. But the water cooling should technically be able to cope with that. Now, what I would say is that the heat sink uh, across the VRMs is just basically a lump of metal. It's like one of the old style heat sinks. And I don't think there's really enough contact with the uh, water cooling there for it to be able to accurately cope. Uh, and I think that's why the temperatures kind of crept up. Maybe it's because they're, it, it, they're running doublers and it's, the, and it's not the Infineon um, uh, MOSFETs that are on there, you know, I, I don't really know, but 68 degrees for me, when you look at the graph and you can see the difference between this and the air-cooled Rampage with the same overclock on the same volts, you can see why it kind of, um, you know, it gets to the point. There. But I do need to stress that the temperatures of the VRMs on this for being able to be doing all of that and delivering all that power still very good. It's only when you compare it to the the other board that it's kind of not. And it also kind of then, it does then make me want to talk to you about the VRMs themselves because they are on doublers. Uh, and I would say that the, the VRM spec on this, by Gigabyte's new standards, their own new standards of having, yes, it's got 16 phases, but it's, it's an eight phase uh, PWM controller which then is doubled up, whereas on the X570 and the TRX40 boards, their own extreme boards, they were dedicated 16 phases with a 16 phase controller. It kind of feels like this board is kind of a, a little bit dated now, and maybe that is why the, the temperatures are not so good. My gut feeling personally is that the, the, the CPU block, sorry, the cooling block design for the top of the board isn't that great. 
uh, and that's why the temperatures kind of rose up a little bit more. Now, the, 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 for me, especially with a board of this price, we are expecting, like I said, to the prices to be, a, the, the only price I've heard so far is $1,100. So we'll just say that it's gonna be a north of a thousand pounds. Now the block looks beautiful as you've seen and looks, you know, it really does make the system. It's really nice. You can change the colors if you want. Yes, we've got all of ours on white here today, uh, apart from the little red flash down the side, but it, it does tick a lot of boxes. But with that block and the, the temps then kind of nudging themselves up, I, I would say I, I'm personally a little bit disappointed with that. But again, I do need to stress, VRM wise, those temperatures are still great. It's just not quite as great as some of the other ones. And by, when I say great, I mean they're completely not safe. The fact that they're below 70 degrees with that much stress on them is just astonishing really. Compared to some of the old boards in the old days, we would have been you know, hoping to keep them below 100 would have been you know, a beautiful thing. Um, so you just kind of need to kind of make peace with yourself that if you do get this and you smash a devilish overclock on like I have, which if you're going to be paying this much money, I kind of think that you owe it to yourself to, that you, you know you know that the VRMs are going to be a little bit warmer, but it's not particularly going to be making any issues. You know, they're completely well within spec and everything. But I will say that I do think that the a slight water block design change would have made all of the difference on this uh, and I think their target should have been about 50 degrees if I'm honest and not 68. Um, so as far as it goes uh, we've got lots of connectivity you've seen the, the the look around the board and everything as well the 24 pin on the on an angle on the side makes life really easy. I think it's a bit of a shame that the two 8 pins they didn't try and do something similar with it so that there was a kind of common design ethos with it. But the actual layout of the board itself and the way everything kind of goes is really nice. With the, the CPU block as well, one thing I've not mentioned, is actually only eight screws for it. So when you um, screw it in, it's uh, you screw through the normal uh, mounting points for like a normal air heat sink. So you don't have to take the, the socket retainer or anything like that off. You kind of screw through that and there's four screws there and there's four screws at the bottom as well and that's it. So it's eight in total. But you do need to kind of realise that if you need to change your M.2 that might, you know, die, then the entire rig needs to come apart because you're going to need to take that water block off. So, it, it, you know, there's, there's kind of caveats there that you do need to kind of keep in mind. So, cooling performance was... Uh, you know, it was all right, but probably not as good as I had hoped, both on the CPU side of things and especially on the VRM side of things. But performance was very strong. And I cannot stress enough why that is quite a good thing as well. And I don't mean because of the price of the board or the water block either, because the overclocks were the same. I mean, just performance when you compare it to the Rampage Encore was really good. Uh, and early on with a nice early BIOS, I'm really happy to see that as well. The BIOS itself is better now than it has been in the past. It's laid out slightly better, but I've, um, I've not found any unwanted glitches or had any issues with it either. It was actually quite a simple process to get it overclocked. And the only thing, if you're gonna be running a massive cord processor, you do need to fish about and find the power increase options just so that you can wind that up. And when you're running a manual overclock or want to be you know, like pushing the limits that little bit more, getting things running that little bit better, you might need to go in there and turn those up that little bit more just so that you're making sure that the CPU is gonna be getting enough power. Um, and that's just because they can use an awful lot of it and they're not necessarily always kind of like hemmed in um, uh, too well at the start. So if you go in there and give them that extra power, you will get slightly better performance and it will make your overclock a lot better. Um, when you are overclocking it, if you do add load on it with like, for argument's sake, Prime without AVX on or OCCT, then you may notice that the um, system will just do an instant turn off when load is applied. That's normally a power problem. And then that's when you can go into the BIOS and turn the power up, not the volts, or, and then you'll probably find it's okay. Also, weirdly, don't know what it is, but it happens with all X299 boards, with a very big uh, overclock, 
on, so you're running on the limits, you may find that if you use OCCT, that it will turn off. OCCT Linpack, it will just, it seems to turn off. But you can then go and use Intel's own Linpack and it doesn't seem to turn off. Or you can go and use Prime without the AVX on and it doesn't turn off either. It's a bit of a weird one. I don't know what it is, but I've, never, I've not actually found an instability with anything other than OCCT. So if you're like me and you would normally use that, go and grab yourself Prime, tick the AVX off down the bottom, uh, use the second, there's a list of tests at the top, use the second one and you'll probably find that it'll run for days and days and days and days and days and won't have any problems and your system will actually be 100% stable. It's, like I said, it just seems to be something strange that's going on with OCCT and it only seems to be X299 that's doing it. I don't know why it has happened before. I just thought I'd mention it. So, lovely board. Performance, as you've seen with the graphs that have been flicking up, has been very strong as well. Uh, VRM temps a bit underwhelming, especially considering that they are water-cooled and that then in lie is a bit of a tough pill to swallow because with the price of the board and everything as well, it does come with an awful lot. Like I said, you've got that add-in card um, that is uh, allows you PCI Express 4 and then obviously you can then run lots of uh, M.2s in it and it's like a little mini graphics card and it, you know, it, it, there are a lot of things in the box that really look nice but also with that add-in card something to consider is if you're going this route the vertical then you kind of haven't got anywhere to put it and it makes your life a little bit difficult so you do need to kind of weigh all these things up so the board for me the performance is there and it's uh the actual raw performance of using it is great the aesthetics brilliant and that's why i would give it the oc 3d aesthetics award just think that water block needs kind of a v2 it needs some refinement to be able to get those temperatures down but more importantly for me is to try and tame those uh the vrm temps and i did say to gigabyte about it as well and they were saying oh it's because it's drawing an awful lot of power and it's uh heat soak going from the cpu as well and it's trying to cool too much uh well i actually think that if you had another water block on it from for argument's sake possibly like ek uh, if Alpha Call ended up doing one, um, you know, any of the other big manufacturers, I do think the temperatures would have been better than this because it is a gigabyte design. And I know I've gone on about the water block a lot, but obviously the water block is like one of the most major parts of it. So looks brilliant, performs all right. It's not unsafe or anything like that. But the, the underlying performance of the actual board that's underneath is the critical thing. And it does do really, really well. You're just going to have to make your mind up whether the water force way and the price is something that you can kind of live with. But if you're going to put a 10980 XE underneath it anyway, you're already going to be like well up into the realms. And you know, this system, when you consider that you've got a 2080 Ti, there's a thousand pound there, thousand pound for a motherboard, thousand pound for the CPU itself, prices kind of run away with themselves very, very quickly. So really enjoyed working with it, slightly disappointed with the temperatures, but hopefully they'll be able to uh, work on this, take this on the chin and then make better versions later on. But for now at least, this has been the tiniest one with the X299X Water Force Extreme. Too many words, out.